Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. Uh, our guest, we're really delighted, uh, really delighted to have our guest with us, uh, Dr. Andrew Basevich, uh, American historian, uh, formerly from the Boston University Party School of Global Studies, a retired colonel in uh, the uh, U.S. Army, and now uh, pr uh, president and founder of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, his uh, 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 latest book, is The Age of Illusions, How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So Andrew, uh, welcome uh, to uh, uh, our program today. Well, thank you for the invitation to join you. I wanted to ask you to start off with, before we get into your book, um, uh, right now as we're wrapping up uh, at Ebenezer Baptist Church, the funeral of John Lewis, and I'd appreciate uh, your thoughts about the life and legacy of John Lewis. Well, clearly he was a great man. Uh, as, as I have been uh, watching the accounts of his life uh, in recent days since his passing, I think one of the things that has struck me most was his raw physical courage uh, as a young man, <laughs> I remember how many times he was assaulted by police authorities, uh, but it was frequent. And I, I, I believe uh, on Bloody Sunday, after the, or during the uh, walk across the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge, he had his skull fractured. So, this certainly is evidence of a level of commitment to the cause of racial equality uh, that uh, is striking. I mean, one, one <laughs> I, I would not have had that courage. Uh, so all the honors that are being, uh, you know, sent his way are clearly uh, appropriate. Uh, one has to wonder in the divided, the divided moment in our politics that we're experiencing right now, you have to wonder if uh, the words spoken in his honor will actually help to heal the divide. I'm a little bit of a pessimist on these matters and I fear that they will not, but uh, they're good words, they're important words. He was an important figure in our history and perhaps uh, with his passing, we'll be able to um, come to a clearer appreciation of what his, what his life actually meant, but we'll have to see. Yeah. I want to talk about uh, uh, your book, uh, The Age of Illusions. Uh, like I say, the subtitle is How America Squandered Its Cold War Victory. And you begin with uh, uh, a quote uh, by James Baldwin, and I, I'm going to just read it. In America, uh, life seems to move faster than anywhere else on the globe, and each generation is promised more than it will get, which creates in each generation a furious, bewildered rage, the rage of a people who cannot find solid ground beneath their feet. How... Why did you choose that quote? How, do, how does that quote capture uh, the tone of your book and maybe of this time? So, uh, in, in a sense, the, the book is my response to the so-called age of Trump. And I put that phrase in quotes, age of Trump. The term has become uh, so much a part of our sort of public discourse, used in the news, used in newspapers. And at least in my interpretation, the, the, the phrase assigns to President Trump himself importance that Trump doesn't deserve. 
I don't think we're in an age of Trump. I think we're in an age of illusions. That's the title of my, of my book. And the, the inspiration of the book, it, it derives from my conviction that if our country's in big trouble right now, and we are in big trouble, Trump is not the source. Trump is not the cause. Trump is a manifestation. Trump, Trump is a symbol. But we ought not to indulge in the notion that Trump himself is the problem. And I think that much of the, much of the sort of the day-to-day -day discussion of our politics, you know, if you read the New York Times or you read the Washington Post or you watch the, you know, CNN, at least implicit in the discussion is the expectation that if we just get rid of this guy, uh, then all will be well. And I try to argue in my book against that expectation. I try to argue in my book that Trump came out of uh, a moment of dysfunction and disappointment. And that's where that James Baldwin quote fits. You know, I think that the, 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 the I, I mean, I certainly think that President Trump is the worst president we've ever had. You know, it's, it's not even close. But I always have to remind myself that he was elected. And I don't, you know, don't give me the uh, Hillary Clinton one more votes. Don't, don't give me the Russians are involved. Don't give me the, I wish the electoral college, you know, didn't exist. Those are interesting arguments, but I think that they are really beside the point. The real point is that much to my dismay, in 2016, 60 whatever million of our fellow citizens voted for this guy. And I think they voted for this guy, not, not because they genuinely believed that Trump was gonna make America great again, but, 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 but because they were, they were voting in protest, their vote was a repudiation. Their vote was a statement that we don't like the direction that our country has taken over the past generation or so, and we're not gonna put up with it anymore. So they elect this guy who, who promises to drain the swamp, you know, who, who, who promises to overturn the establishment uh, because that's what they want to see. They want to see that happen. Um, and that, I think that's, that's why I wrote the book. I'm gonna come back to, I'm gonna come back to the election a little later, but uh, the upcoming election <clears throat> because uh, uh, you ask uh, uh, at, at one point, you know, what now? But we'll come back to that. I, I want to stay with the age of illusions for for a moment. Under the the t under the chapter who, uh, whose title is "Glimpsing the Emerald City," you discuss four post Cold War assumptions. You call them signs of hubris: uh, globalized neoliberalism, global leadership expressed in permanent military supremacy removal of constraints on human freedom and presidential supremacy, what you call presidential wizardry. How are these four the signs of our times? And you don't have to discuss all four if you don't want, but pick a couple that kind of summarize what you're talking about. So the point of departure, I mean, as a, as a first chapter that gives us a, a background and context, right. yeah. but really the point of departure of the book is the end of the Cold War. Uh, you know, I grew, I, I was born in 1947, which is basically the year the Cold War began. I grew up as a Cold War kid. Uh, I served in the military during the latter part of, of, the, of the Cold War. And I think for many members of my generation and, and my parents' generation, the, the, the Cold War really was the organizing principle of international politics at a time 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, when international politics really took prior priority over domestic politics. I mean, the most important thing was prevent World War III, contain the commies, 
uh, and when the Cold War then ended, end of the Cold War caught everybody by surprise. It, it was not as if the CIA was sending reports uh, to uh, first President Reagan and then, and then President uh, Bush that uh, pay attention now because pretty soon the entire Soviet empire is gonna collapse. And as soon as that happens, the Soviet Union itself is gonna collapse. So when the end came, really the moment of course is the fall of the Berlin Wall in the fall of 1989. When the, when the end came, it came as a surprise and it was a surprise, of course, that was greeted with elation, happiness. But it was a, it also, I think, was a surprise that really caught us to lose our bearings, and in particular, the American political elite and intellectual elite to lose their, to lose their bearings. We thought we had won. <laughs> it was over. And that famous uh, article by uh, Francis Fukuyama, The End of History. The end of history. Uh, he's a serious scholar. He's a very intelligent man. And he was examining the, you know, what, what is the significance of what is happening, he, he asked. And, and when and the significance was that, uh, that he believed that the, really the, the, the central questions of history with a capital H, had now been answered. And the answer was that the American way of life was destined to prevail everywhere. Now, he didn't say it that way. But he talked, he talked about liberalism and democracy. But in a sense, those are code words. When we say liberalism and democracy, we mean our liberalism, our democracy. And the, and the end of history was that those values would now prevail everywhere because Fukuyama said there really was no alternative. I mean, the only alternative had been fascism and communism. By 1989, fascism and communism had been totally discredited. So there's only one system left. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be picking on Fukuyama. I think the reason that Fukuyama's essay had such an incredible impact, particularly in Washington, is because people said, yeah, <laughs> That's what I think. I think what he just wrote. And so as we embark upon the, on the 1990s, you know, the first post-Cold War president is Bill Clinton. It is a time of hubris because we think we've got the answers. You want to have, have a prosperous country? Then you, would, you need to embrace neoliberalism. You need to embrace this notion of a wide open world in which capitalism is allowed free reign and everybody's gonna get rich. You need, to, you need to embrace the reality that now there's only one superpower and that's us. And that therefore, as the one superpower, people believed and said in the 1990s, it was incumbent upon the United States to maintain order with the United States called upon to enforce order where order broke down. And this of course was informed by an expectation that American military power was simply matchless. You know, who, who, who was gonna, who's gonna challenge the United States militarily? Well, if somebody did, if some foolish entity did, they would be immediately slapped down. And then the third element is this, is this notion of freedom. Now, I happen to be a conservative Catholic, and I, I happen to be very much a traditionalist when it comes to many uh, moral questions. I also happen to understand that my team lost the culture wars definitively. But that said, the winning, the winning side in the culture wars, the, you know, the, 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 the side that, uh, doesn't believe in, in the importance of the traditional family structure, the side that doesn't believe in the sanctity of, of life. Uh, that school of thought had I mean, already, going back at least to the 1960s, but certainly after the Cold War, that school of thought basically said, hey man, the old rules don't apply. And the 
the opportunity to pursue an unrestrained definition of individual freedom was now at hand. And all this together, you know, neoliberalism, globalization, American military power, autonomy for the individual, all that together is what I described as the, the Emerald City, the vision of a version of utopia that was now in the post-Cold War world, ours for the asking. I want to follow up with you. Uh, you, you describe yourself as a conservative Catholic. Uh, uh, I'm from St. Louis originally, uh, uh, a Catholic city. You're from uh, Normal, Illinois. And Indiana, well, I was, I was born in Normal. Indiana. I, yeah, I didn't really grow up in Normal. My, my, my dad was going to school in the GI Bill. Yeah, you said Hammond, Indiana. Yeah. Then. Uh, so both of these with a certain Midwestern ethos, you know. Yep. Uh, yep. You describe yourself... Uh, uh, well, let me say it this way. As I understand Catholicism, there's sin and salvation, a culture of life, uh, the, so, the, the seamless garment, just war theory. When I think of Catholicism, that's, you know, that's how I, uh, uh, th those are some of the things that come to my mind. How, how would you describe your kind of conservative Catholicism? And I think in one article, you even talked about it as countercultural. Um, so talk about your, how, how that has shaped your worldview. Well, I, I, I think Catholicism is countercultural today. I mean, one, I think one could say the same thing about many uh, mainstream uh, faiths. Uh, I mean, a serious Muslim is countercultural. An Orthodox Jew is countercultural. That is to say, these are people of faith who, who push back against some of the most important expressions of our late modernity, such as the emphasis on consumerism, on you know, acquisition as somehow one of the purposes of life. Uh, and I think push, push back against the inclination to discard traditional norms related to sex, sexuality, the family. Uh, again, I know my side has lost this battle. I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not sort of trying to, to, to lead a fight to, uh, to reopen uh, the war. Uh, but from my perspective, the abandonment of the notion of a traditional family as the, the place that is best suited to raise children so that they will become mature adults, uh, I think that that's been uh, a bad thing for our society. Uh, and, and I guess that's much of what Catholicism means to me. Let me pick up on what you just said about materialism. You recently wrote, uh, I referenced this in my uh, introductory letter to you. I thought it was a very important article entitled Racism, Yes, But What About Militarism? and materialism. And in it, you referenced uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s Riverside Church sermon a year to the day right. before he uh, was killed. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign uh, for Moral Revival is very, very close to our hearts here. We uh, interviewed Reverend Louis Theo Harris, one of the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign. And you know that those giant triplets of kings that he referenced in the sermon uh, are at the heart of the poor people's campaign. You want to say you want to say a word about uh, uh, that article in particular, and then King's Giant Triplets and your take on them. Yeah. So this is an incredibly uh, profound uh, presentation that he made at the Riverside Church in uh, New York City in 1967. 
This was this was when he he really came out against the Vietnam War. Yeah. And there was a lot of pushback. You know, hey, Dr. King, you're supposed to be worried about racism. What the heck are you doing engaging in this contentious debate about uh, the ongoing Vietnam War? But at least in my reading, the core, the core message was that the American soul is threatened by three different related phenomena. Militarism was one of them. Militarism, he argued, others believed, that it found expression in this, uh, in this Vietnam War that was causing so much devastation uh, in Southeast Asia and so much division at home. But not just militarism, obviously also racism that had been his primary cause. There's racism, there's militarism. And, and the third triplet he said was, was materialism. I think he described it as extreme materialism. Uh, and, and his point, I think, was that there was an urgent need to take on all three. This was at a time when there was an effort to take on militarism in, by, by those who opposed the Vietnam War. There was something of an effort to take on, on racism because the civil rights movement was uh, in full flower, but no, nobody was particularly paying attention to uh, to uh, to materialism. So when I wrote that little article, I was basically saying, okay, here we are in 2020. Uh, the Black Lives Movement has produced a important, necessary a renewal of our uh, understanding of the persistence of racism. But in, in at least my own observation of our political discourse, it didn't seem to me anybody was paying much attention to either militarism uh, or extreme materialism. And what was true in 1967 is true in 19 is is true in 2020. Uh, dealing with just one of the three will not get us to a society that is what just, equal, humane. Is a need to take, to take on all three. Let me let me return to uh, uh, your book, The Age of Illusions. Uh, you said that you voted for Obama, uh, President Obama twice. Yet, quote, I view his eight years in office with a mixture of sadness and dismay. More than anything else, his presidency represented a missed opportunity. Well, I, I don't regret uh, voting for him. You know, when, when we vote, we vote, there's only, there's alternatives. We don't, we don't get to say, well, I think I'd like to vote for Abraham Lincoln. You know, Lincoln's not on the ballot. Uh, and I think in, in so many respects, he's an admirable uh, man. Uh, and you met him, you said in the book. Yeah, he, he had, believe it or not, I mean, it was astonishing. He had me come down for lunch, just the two of us in a little room off the uh, Oval Office, like an hour. Uh, memorable occasion for me. I suspect that he's forgotten it because he's <laughs> met a lot of other people since. Uh, but, and I don't think my judgment about his presidency is mine alone. And that is that for all his good intentions and for all his intelligence and sophistication, I don't think he really had the will to do what he intended to do, wanted to do. He allowed himself to be constrained by the system, by Washington. Of course, it's, I've never been president. You know, so it's easy for me to say, yeah, well, you should just uh, you know, push those constraints aside and do what you want to do. You're the president. But I do think he ended up being constrained. And I think, I think a good example is the uh, uh, Are, are the wars that he inherited. Uh, you know, he, he got us out of Iraq for a moment. And then as a consequence of the rise of ISIS, we were back in it and we're still there today. I think he rather foolishly escalated the war in Afghanistan. I think he like uh, roughly uh, 
quadrupled or quintupled the number of US troops there uh, in a mistaken effort to win Afghanistan. And I suspect in his heart of hearts he, that he himself probably is disappointed by his inability to close those wars down. Because as long as those wars continue, of course, to a very, not total, uh, but to a very considerable extent, they sort of use up bandwidth, political bandwidth, that might be available to use for other purposes. So, In, in some senses, a remarkable man, but I think a disappointment as a president. Perhaps uh, it's happened uh, uh, throughout our history, uh, and especially maybe in the Nixon years, but I guess I, I don't know the time when the commander in chief has deployed the US military for such obvious domestic political goals as we're seeing today, uh, especially since the murder of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and others, and so blatantly to suppress domestic demonstrations and protests like in Portland and you know coming attractions in other US cities. As a military man, uh, how do you view all this? Well, I don't feel myself as a military man because I've been out of the army now for longer than I was ever in it. Uh, but I guess as a citizen, I'm, I'm sort of appalled by it all, uh, but not surprised. Uh, I think we've understood for some time that, and he's really said it out loud, you know, that he believes that he has, the president believes he has the power to do anything he wants. In other words, we have a president who doesn't view himself as constrained by the Constitution. Uh, and so, uh, when he gets an itch to do something, uh, he does it. Now, I, I, I think the newspaper reporting about this use of federal agents to suppress disorder in places like Portland, Oregon, I think the newspapers are probably right. What we have now is a president who recognizes that his chances for reelection are rapidly uh, dwindling. And so he's desperate to come up with some kind of a mechanism that will you know, turn things around. I, I don't understand how he thinks that you know, beating up on American citizens is going to it's going to please some people, uh, but I can't imagine how he how he calculates that's a, a strategy for winning a majority in the electoral college. But it's all pretty contemptible. There's no doubt about it. But I mean, there's a lot of things that he's done have been pretty contemptible. Yeah. Um, last month, we've had Danny uh, Danny Sherson, Major Danny Sherson, uh, here in Fort Wayne in 2018. And together you wrote an article uh, a little while ago uh, with your 10 recommendations, nominations for renaming U.S. Army and Army National Guard installations across the South. Um, one of them was Captain George McGovern for Fort Sumter. Another one was Lieutenant Daniel Inouye for Fort Polk. And the, the one I liked the best was... Uh, Geronimo for Fort Bragg. Uh, say more about those recommendations. If you want to talk about other ones too, that'd be fine. Well, I mean, this is a short piece we did for the LA Times. And Danny, you, so you all know Danny, and he's a, a, a wonderful person. Uh, and a gutsy, a gutsy guy of principle. Uh, more, more, he has more of an activist temperament than I do. So I proposed this to him. And I said, and this, is a, this was done with, you know, a little bit of a tongue in cheek. We don't seriously think that anybody in the Pentagon is going to consult Danny and me about how to uh, rename these posts that are currently named after Confederate generals. Although that renaming is almost certain to happen now. I mean, that is going to happen. Yeah. So we wanted to, uh, we wanted the group to be diverse. No. 
black, white, male, female. We, want, we wanted our selections to basically run the gamut of American wars ever since the Civil War. So we had somebody from the Civil War, we had somebody from the period after the Civil War, you know, somebody from uh, uh, World War I, a couple, two, a couple people from World War II, Korea, Vietnam. So we're sort of marching, marching forward through the uh, modern period of American military history. And we got to the end. And uh, I, have, I, I will take the credit or the blame. It was my idea. I said, look, Fort Bragg is the home of, the, of, of U.S. Army airborne troops, paratroopers. First time we used paratroopers was in World War II. And during World War II, when paratroopers jumped out of their airplane, they would shout, Geronimo. So I thought, well, then let's name Fort Bragg Fort Geronimo after a great American warrior. I mean, he was a great American warrior fighting against the, uh, the US Army, but in retrospect, uh, his cause was certainly an honorable one uh, to, to protect his people uh, from the depredations of the United States government, which has, you know, for a couple of centuries now, uh, treated Native Americans with great uh, injustice. So, so that's why we, we suggested that Fort Bragg become Fort Geronimo. I don't think anybody has taken up that thought uh, to this point. Well, I found the article not only to be interesting, but it, it, it pushed the envelope, you know, and uh, that's what I appreciated most about it. Well, the other thing we also, I didn't mention it, but the other thing was we said, Let's not name any, and we let's not rename any of these posts after generals. Uh, you know, the practice of doing that sort of implies that generals, because they're generals, are better soldiers than people who are not generals. And both Danny and I disagree with that proposition. So our list of names was, you know, you know, one was named after a sergeant, one was named after a private, and uh, Daniel Inouye uh, fought in Italy during World War II. He was a lieutenant. Uh, George McGovern flew uh, B-24 bombers. He was the captain. None of these people ended up being generals, uh, but as role models of honorable and brave American soldiers, we thought they offered a heck of a lot more than most of the generals that Danny and I uh, have personally met. And, and I don't, you know, I, I doubt if more than three soldiers who go through the gates at Fort Bragg on a daily basis, think about who Braxton Bragg was, you know, who cares? That said, at least in theory, it would be nice to name these installations after people whose soldiers might identify as role models, soldiers who embodied certain values. And in that regard, it seemed to me it was, it was, it was better to have them be soldiers who, who were more or less at the same level as most of us. They're not, gen, you know, they're, generals get enough applause as it is. <laughs> You're a frequent critic, critic of uh, American exceptionalism, um, uh, which yeah, I'm a religious studies, retired religious studies professor, and it takes a certain amount of faith, right? It embodies a certain kind of faith. How has that kind of faith shaped our domestic and foreign, even military policies? And how has the pandemic exposed the limitations of American exceptionalism in your mind? So. I think it's, it's important to recognize that the, 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 the conception of American exceptionalism has changed over time. Early on, let's say in the 17th century, at the time of the founding of the Anglo-American colonies, it was deeply religious and, and Christian, specifically Christian, and specifically Protestant Christian, that the claim was that the the Anglo-Americans who were creating these colonies in the new world were God's new chosen people. Uh, and that the purpose of founding this place called America, what we called America, uh, 
was to participate in a in a in a universal redemptive mission that the Americans of North America were going to establish a city upon a hill, as John Winthrop said. We weren't going to conquer the world. We weren't going to make the rest of the world abide by specific tenets of Protestant Christianity, but we were going to be an exemplar to demonstrate the efficacy of Christian love. And therefore, the rest of the world will ultimately follow in our example. So this notion changes radically over time. So when you get to the, let's say, the post 9-11 period, our time, it has lost virtually all of its religious connotations. It has become entirely secular. American exceptionalism has become secular. But the core notion that we are called upon to redeem the world remains. The means, however, has changed substantially. It's no longer that we're going to serve as an exemplar. So we are going to basically bring our values, even enforce our values on the rest of the world. And, you know, I, I, I grew up, A, not knowing that phrase, but basically buying into that notion. You know, we're the best country in the world. And, you know, we got freedom and we got equality and we got prosperity. I mean, seems like everybody else ought to put a buy into that. But, you know, you get a little bit older and you start to think, what a preposterous claim. What an what a absurd claim. Uh, to, to claim to be the chosen people either from a, from a Christian religious point of view or from a secular point of view. And I think the post-Cold War period has really, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say it has discredited the idea. The idea persists. But I think the post-Cold War experience has, has exposed to anybody who's willing to pay attention how preposterous the claims of American exceptionalism are. Now, you ask, so how does the pandemic fit into all that? I don't know. No, the pandemic is still in progress. Uh, it, we speculate, I speculate, about what, what it will mean uh, once we get through this, and we will get through it. And I'm, I'm hesitant to say that it's going to uh, demolish uh, the claims of American exceptionalism. Because that belief that we are the chosen people really is deeply, deeply embedded, I think, in our, in our, in our psyche. But we'll see. We'll see. Well, you know, uh, I've often said to my students that really American exceptionalism, manifest destiny, that really comes straight from the Great Commission. It's just it's been secularized. You know, right. I mean, it's, it's uh, the secular, it's religious, it's religious in form, having shorn its religious content if that makes sense, you know, yes. and that's, that's, uh, that's how I used to teach it with my students. Uh, let, let, me, let me shift gears uh, to uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, in your book, America's War for the Greater Middle East, you say, very starkly, you say, we're stuck. And in answer to the question, why can't we get out, you list some assumptions that, quote, pervade the U.S., national security establishment. Now, I have them listed here if you need me to list them, but... You, you do, because I can't remember what I wrote. Those who for me, I'll, I'll read them quickly, and then pick one or two to talk about is, is really what I'm, what I'm wanting to ask you. Those who formulate U.S. Middle East policy are able to discern the historical forces at work in the region. That's one myth or one assumption. The U.S. as the sole global superpower can control and direct those forces. U.S. military power offers the most expeditious means to ensure that freedom. 
and for America's purposes will ultimately win acceptance even in the Islamic world. So those are the four basic assumptions you say that are really myths. And, uh, uh, and, and that's the answer to the question, why can't we get out? Yeah, because those assumptions persist. Yeah. Uh, uh, President, President Trump doesn't buy them. Uh, but you know, President Trump's efforts to extricate us from that part of the world have been repeatedly frustrated. Uh, by members of his own administration, by Republicans, by Democrats, by the media. Uh, you know, he wants out and uh, he ain't going to get out because uh, of the forces that, that are in resistance. Well, let's chat, go to the third and the fourth one, I guess. You know, and let's talk about 9-11 you know, and its aftermath. President George W. Bush is a, a genuinely religious, a genuine, he's a believer, he's a believer. There's no question in my mind that he is a man of faith. He's also caught totally by surprise by 9-11, didn't have a plan. Uh, and responded to that shock by persuading himself that he was summoned to liberate the Middle East. To bring democracy, to bring freedom, to make friends for America, among in a place where America didn't have a heck of a lot of friends, and he had great confidence in the American military instrument, and so we embarked upon this thing called uh, the Iraq War in 2003, which was which was not intended in just simply. I mean, the, getting rid of Saddam Hussein was a sideshow, an afterthought. The object of the exercise was to begin a regional process of transformation that would be put in motion by the invasion of Iraq, but would lead to a broader transformation uh, because Bush believed, first of all, nothing can stop the American military. And secondly, because Bush believed that American values, American institutions would be easily transferable to the people of Iraq, the people of Syria, the people of Iran, the people of Egypt, you know, people of Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, and events said otherwise. Uh, and, and the result of embarking upon that project, it's cost us about $6 trillion. And, Thousands killed and tens of thousands wounded, probably a couple hundred thousand people in the region have been uh, lost their lives. And, um, and the, the, the region may have been uh, an unhappy place, but before 2003, at least it was a relatively stable place. Uh, and we, we demolished that stability. Uh, and, and the result is the mess that, uh, that we see. I want to bore down even further and, and from the broader Middle East to uh, Israel and Palestine. You talk about the two-state solution as an illusion. And uh, I'll just quote from a 2017 article. As remorselessly as white settlers once encroached upon territory inhabited by Native American tribes, Israeli settlers expand their presence in the occupied territories year by year. In fact, as you know, uh, the uh, Israel, Israeli government has announced this uh, annexation of, uh, of uh, large parts uh, uh, of the Jordan Valley, of uh, the West Bank, and uh, 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 of Jerusalem. Uh, so talk about that, but also say a word about, uh, if you know much about the, uh, if the two-state solution is an illusion, which many of us have been talking about for years now, for over a decade, say a word about maybe one, the different one-state solution proposals or other, way, other possible ways forward. Well, I mean, I, honestly, I don't know. Uh, it's possible that 
Palestinians could bring themselves to accepting an arrangement that would provide the illusion of a sovereign state, but not the reality. That in a sense, Palestine would be a colony of, of Israel. Certain territories set aside, certain prerogatives allowed, other aspects of sovereignty totally denied. It could be that the Palestinian people would say, well, given the disparity in power between our side and their side, that's the best deal we can get. I don't see any evidence that's going to happen, but I yeah, guess that, that could happen. Uh, otherwise, I mean, yeah, another solution is that if the annexation continues, and it sounds like it's been put on hold for the moment, uh, Israel will, will put itself in a position where it will become increasingly difficult to push back against the charge already made by some that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, the, the pushback is very vigorous. And it's, I think it's very vig it's not only vigorous from Israel, but it's, it's very vigorous from partisans of Israel in our country. Uh, but at some point, the the undeniable evidence of something that sure looks like apartheid will be difficult to, to deny. And I guess this, the third scenario is the continuation of, of or the renewal of violence, uh, you know, to violence by Palestinians or violence by uh, non-Palestinian Arabs to try to coerce Israel into permitting the creation of a Palestinian state. That sure the heck hasn't worked so far, uh, but that doesn't mean that Palestinians couldn't uh, try that again. Yeah. Well, I'm eager for you to, I'm eager for you to uh to meet some of these Palestinian activists uh, who embrace a, a nonviolent resistance. And I hope we can make that work. Um, let, me, uh, let me return to your book, The Age of Illusion. Uh, I was happy to see at the end of the book that you remind us that great changes, and you used uh, abolition uh, as an example, occur when the American people rally around a, a large cause. And then you say that in our day, that large cause is climate change. What do you think it's going to take to uh, to wake us up uh, and make a uh, and and wake up Washington to make real lasting change in policy, behavior, and lifestyle? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's going to take a, a uh, gutsy leadership on the part of somebody, and not somebody, a party, a president, and and his or her party. Because let's face it, in the short term, addressing climate change in a serious way is going to involve sacrifice. It's going to put some people out of work. You know, uh, Mr. Biden says, oh, I got a plan. We're going to create all kinds of new jobs. Well, maybe so. Uh, but those kind of transitions don't happen overnight. They don't happen without costs. Leadership's going to have to persuade the American people that the, the near-term sacrifice is worth longer-term benefit. Uh, and I think President Obama kind of wanted to do that. But again, that's another example of where he was not able to really push through uh, the program we want. And let's face it, you know, you know what I just said suggests that uh, it's just a matter of presidential leadership, and that's not. We 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 do have a constitution, uh, and you got to have a majority of the Congress buy into any 
major reform program. Uh, and it's, it's members of the Congress who are most, I think, uh, aware of uh, you know, suffering back in the home districts. Uh, you, know, you know, the members of the House are running, they're constantly running for re-election because they're only in for two years. You can't get reelected. You can't, you, can't, you can't afford to be alienating too many of your constituents. You can't, you can't afford to say, well, well I, I, know, I, know that, I know that the coal mines and the power plants are shutting down and all you people are being thrown out of work. But trust me, three or four or five years from now, things are going to be good. Uh, so it's tough, you know, it's tough. But, you know, if Biden wins, he's, he's now embracing all this Green New Deal stuff. Will he do so if he's in office? Will, will there be a Democratic Congress? Uh, a, a Senate controlled by the Republicans is not going to suddenly turn green uh, under a, a, a Biden presidency. You know, uh, I can only speak for myself. I, I think I know um, uh, most of the folks that I see on the screen would be more would not be voting for the current administration. But even with a Biden presidency, right? I mean, he needs, and a Democratic Congress, uh, uh, we need to hold their feet to the fire, yes? I mean, uh, not only in terms of climate change, but in terms of the giant triplets. Right. Uh, and also, I mean, there's been bipartisan support uh, for, for uh, a bipartisan, almost, absolutist support for the state of Israel, although that's beginning to crack a little bit with some new members of Congress. Um, so how do we, do you have any advice about holding these people's feet to the fire? I mean, how do you do that? I don't have any advice. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not sufficiently a student of American politics to, uh, to say much uh, of any specificity. Although, again, as you suggested in, uh, with reference to my book, you know, there are, there have been instances uh, in our history where there is a sort of welling up of demand. You mentioned abolition, which we, abolitionism, which we would say that's a positive example where the people aroused uh, brought about substantial change. We could also point to prohibition as I think a negative example you know, where yeah. the people aroused wanted to prohibit the production and sale of alcohol. Well, that, that turned into a fiasco. Uh, so it's not necessarily that the people are right, but I do think it's true that ultimately the politicians respond to the will of the people. Yeah, you make that point at the end of uh, Age of Illusions that really uh, oftentimes these great movements for change come from the bottom up and not from the top down. And so it's incumbent upon the, the population, the, the people, to, uh, to gain a critical mass in order to yeah. promote change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Say a word. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to say a word about the Quincy Institute. Uh, the mission, we promote ideas that move U.S. foreign policy away from endless war toward vigorous diplomacy in pursuit of peace. Yeah, so, the Quint so they, there's yeah, like about, about 567 think tanks in Washington, D.C., and we're now the 568th, I guess. Yeah, uh, I, I, wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you specifically, what didn't you see among all the other think tanks that, that well, caused... None, none, them, none of them agree with our point of view. Our point of view is that... Uh, U.S. foreign policy has come to be excessively militarized. The reliance on force has been costly and counterproductive. And therefore, there needs to be a fairly radical shift in the way we engage the rest of the world. Our core principle is restraint. To emphasize diplomacy and dialogue and to define force as a last resort. It's not been a last resort in our country over the last 40 years. So there is a mindset uh, in Washington, in both parties, they won't own up to it, but in favor of 
making sure that we have far and away the biggest military budget in the world, making sure that we have hundreds of bases around the world, making sure that we organize the military not to defend the country, but to serve as an instrument of intervention. That's what the establishment thinks, believes in, supports. Our mission is to change the way people in Washington and in the country more broadly think about our role in the world. <clears throat> and we, you know, we are, we got, a, we got a long haul in front of us. You know, we're, we're not supported by Grumman. We're not supported by general dynamics. Uh, money's hard to come by for a perspective such as ours, you know, promoting peace instead of preparing for war. But that's what we're about. That's what we're trying to do. It's, uh, I think it's an honorable undertaking and, uh, you know, call, call me back in five years and we can give you a progress report to see if we're actually getting anywhere. Well, I, I was eager to meet you because what's the personal magic of Andrew Basevich that, that, uh, that gets funding from both George, I didn't do that. Soros, I, I, George I didn't, Soros and Charles Koch? I didn't do that. And that, <laughs> that, that deal was arranged before I came on board. But um, what it, reflect, it reflects the fact that I've never met either Mr. Soros or Mr. Koch. I've never met them. But they both kicked in substantial sums of money to, uh, to found this Quincy Institute because they are both opposed to militarism. They may disagree on a million other things, but they agree that the militarization of US foreign policy over the past several decades has been a mistake and it needs to be corrected. Well, I found that to be admirable. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the fact that the Quincy Institute was able to pull that off was pretty amazing to me. Um, I've just got one more question and we're gonna wrap it up. It's, it's, not, it's a long one, but let me uh, 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 get through it and then I'll give you a chance to answer. You recently wrote on, on the 75th anniversary of VE Day an article entitled, The Greatest Generation We Are Not. And it was an indictment, really, I thought of baby boomers, my generation. I mean, my generation. M mine too. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, among the many points you make is that, quote, the approach to statecraft that grew out of VE Day defined the ultimate purpose of the U.S. policy in terms of resisting evil, viewing problems through the lens of World War II in Europe, has produced deeply flawed policy decisions while also deceiving the American people. This has inhibited our ability to see the world as it actually is. And then you go on and say, the challenge facing the United States is not never again. It's what now? So that's what I wanted to close with, Andrew. What now? Well, I mean, I, we, this is ground we've covered before, I think, in a way. I mean, I think what now is to... Uh, reflect on the words of Martin Luther King in 1967. As a conceptualization of our problems, of our challenges, that demands attention, all three of them. Racism, militarism, extreme materialism. Uh, I don't think I don't think it's something we, we pick and can pick and choose from. Uh, but I also think that it, you know, the American people, the American people today, you know, we are up in arms about racism and that is a good thing. We are not up in arms about militarism. We are not up in arms about extreme materialism. Uh, so there needs to be a, a you know, a change of consciousness if we're going to get to this stuff. So, Andrew, uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, any parting words for us? I'm very grateful for, for having had the chance to have this conversation. I, I, it was fun. I appreciate it. Good, good. Well, once again, Dr. Andrew Basevich of the Quincy Institute for Strategic uh, for uh, Responsible Statecraft. Uh, thanks for joining us.